This is Talk It Out, the Women's Agenda podcast. Tune in for your weekly download on the latest news, trends and ideas affecting your career or your business. Here's your host, Angela Priestley. Hello and welcome to the Women's Agenda podcast. I am here in the studio with Georgie Dent, our contributing editor on Women's Agenda. How are you, Georgie? Very well, thank you. And our guest today is Faye Calderoni, a partner with Hall & Wilcox. How are you, Faye? Hi, Ange. Great to be here. And my name is Angela Priestley and we are from, well, Georgie and I are from Women's Agenda. We publish our newsletter every day just before lunchtime. We like to do the reminder every time in the podcast to get more people subscribing. So if you don't subscribe, um, get on to that. And a lot of the things that we discuss in these podcasts, we've also shared through various different stories, different ways, different opinion pieces along the way on Women's Agenda as well which very much is a couple of the issues that we are talking about today. So first off, just a little bit more on Faye. Now, Faye won one of our Women's Agenda Leadership Awards a few years ago as an emerging leader in the private sector. It was before we had a legal sector award. Um, so that was when you're with a different firm. You, you joined Hall & Wilcox earlier this year. And recently, Women's Agenda, we've worked with Holland Wilcox on running a number of roundtables on how we can shift the status quo on a number of different issues. And the latest being how we can shift the status quo on the lack of cultural diversity in our leadership. And we've just published a piece on that as well, which you can go and check out. So Faye's expertise is on employment law. She's a regular speaker and expert on employment issues and is very active on social media and Twitter, which we love to see lawyers doing. <laughs> She's a great person for our topic today, which includes looking at whether workplaces are actually changing in the wake of Me Too. Also, if workplace flexibility is as normal as we'd hope it to be. And I should add that nothing that we're sharing here is legal advice. <laughs> yes. The disclaimer. Thank you for the disclaimer, Ange. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we are recording this in the final weeks of 2018 and the year that was slated to be the year of woman, women. Um, that we'd see more women elected to US Congress. That was the hope and it did actually happen. Um, and really it's been a year that Australian politics has really uh, seen the lack of women represented in government come to the fore and continuously make headline news as well. Um, so, But 2018 was also the one that followed 2017 in which a number of high profile women, particularly in Hollywood, called out the sexual misconduct of a number of very high profile individuals it shone a light on the power imbalance that occurs in the workplaces that can really leave a lot of women and others feeling very vulnerable and very vulnerable without even feeling it, just vulnerable. Um, and the prediction was a trickle-down effect, and I think we have seen some of that. Um, we've seen that in the Australian media and into some Australian workplaces, but I guess we're wondering if it's gone all that far, if it's gone as far as it could have been or should have been. And also we're wondering if we risk fatigue on these issues as well. Mm. So Faye, being an employment lawyer, who is obviously passionate about advising leaders about, um, I mean, I've read this on your profile mm. around bullying, harassment and discrimination, I assume around trying to avoid those things occurring yes. in the yes. first place. And not, yes, and you're not trying to create best <laughs> yeah. practice leaders at bullying or harassment. No, <laughs> no. Get them to avoid it happening and avoid Entirely. doing it as well <laughs> and seeing it in their team. So What's your thoughts? Have you seen much shift in how workplaces are responding to this and hopefully responding in a way that aims to avoid it happening in the first place? That's exactly right. I, I, the laws have been around and you know fairly unchanged for over 30 years, but never before have we seen so much momentum around um, these issues. And it's not so much that there's been an increase of reporting of the issues or increase in complaints. There's probably been a marginal increase. What I'd say there has been is a propensity to investigate independently, um, certainly an appetite to deal with the issues and a harder um, line on managing offenders in, in the workplace when they do come up, particularly on, you know, obviously substantiated issues. I think there's, you know, mo multiple things at play. Um, Me Too movement um, undeniably has um, increased transparency and accountability, which has led to um, fear about things like brand damage and reputational issues that, you know, leaders are, are personally concerned about. Um, but also, the, the, you know, the, there's an increased appreciation of the mental health consequences um, arising from things like sexual harassment. And so any 
advisor um, like myself that is looking at a sexual harassment case um, will not divorce it from issues like you know the the impact on work health and safety and the employees welfare at work and considerations of um, things like adverse action and victimization and all the broader issues at play yes we don't have like a systematic um, regime that that puts it all in one basket um, but it would be naive and ill-advised to not look at the broader um, risks both legal and um, you know from from an employee morale and health point of view yeah yeah and also around women leaving or, or anyone absolutely leaving, young the revolving leaving, door that, yeah the revolving door and the next generation is um very invest mm. very altruistic and very invested in sort of you know values driven leadership and they will um walk out the door if they um believe and you know, the millennial sur- Deloitte Milon- millennial survey i think found that they will leave um, if they feel that a workplace does not, um, mm. you know, is in sync with their values. And mm. possibly have a heightened um, appetite themselves to actually make a complaint. If Correct. Something occurs. And that bystander piece, you know, is what we're hoping will, will achieve cultural change. Um, and with the next generation being like that, you know, the two things together might actually see um, the shift and momentum that we need. Mm. Georgie. Faye, I'm interested to know, obviously you've worked in employment law well before Me Too. Mm. And because I think for some people the scale, the numbers involved of of people making disclosures, not just of sort of Hollywood Mm. actresses, but just in terms of the number of stories that we've seen shared on social media, Mm. I think it really has... um, made it clear that this is not a fringe issue necessarily as much as we'd like to believe. I'm interested to know from your work experience, is that something that you have had an appreciation of for a long time, that sexual harassment mm. has been far more prevalent than people wanted to believe? Absolutely. Um, and there are, you know, things that I've, that I've seen that are, you know, characteristic of um, sexual harassers in the workplace. The power imbalance has always been, you know, something that's been front of mind to me. And, and um, you know, obviously the way that things resolve very quietly and that, you know, certain cultures, d- dysfunction perpetuates in mm. certain cultures um, and when it goes unchecked and that the little stuff leads to the bigger stuff. So I've made those observations over the years, but I think, you know, the... Um, and also, I suppose the other thing I should note is the um, lack of appetite to deal with offenders, um, both bullies and sexual harassers in circumstances where they are very good at delivering on you know mm. financial results. And it mm. sort of takes a certain the, the t- genius personality. Jerk idea. The, yeah, <laughs> the brilliant <laughs> jerk, the, brilliant jerk, sorry, the yeah. high flying salesman, yeah, the you know, rainmaker. the, the, the mm. you know the consulting doctor who is like you know has got that god complex mm. because they're so amazing. The, the barrister, well. the athlete. Yeah. I mean, you you can. You, you, you can see it a mile away, you know, often and you can see just the little things that they do and it kind of is not surprising um, when the big things come come to the forefront. I, I suppose the appetite to um, tolerate um, these issues um, is reducing mm. because of the concerns about, you know, brand damage if I'm, if I'm perfectly honest mm. um in the uh, you know in the first instance but then like I said the br- the broader um imperatives of um you know diversity d- you can't create a diverse and inclusive workplace if you are tolerating sexual harassment even the little things mm. so mm. um if you're going to create a healthy and productive workplace that is inclusive um and and that is a, a, an imperative for a lot of businesses now recognizing the benefits that that brings You've just got to, um, you know, get rid of give, get rid of the jerks. Mm. <laughs> yes, or don't hire it's them in the first place. It's There's also that. Advice, so it's so it basic, get rid of but, a jerk. Yeah. Yeah. but and they could all go and live all together somewhere. Well, they could start a business that <laughs> yeah. would um, yeah. be very with a revolving can... door down the bottom, yeah. like a really big one. <laughs> yes, but it'd be really mm. lovely for junior staff to go and join, mm. uh, potentially avoid like anything. <laughs> but um, so. Do we, uh, you know, one thing we're talking before we started recording about the fact that in, on women's agenda, we're finding that stories that um, have Me Too in the headline are not actually that well read anymore. So we actually mm. find other ways to publish those to ensure mm. that they get well read. And I wonder if it is because there is a little bit of fatigue or something around this issue. I don't know. Mm. But do you, is that a concern for you going into 2019 that, that maybe it sort of followed this wave that mm. maybe that could disappear without the real long-lasting change Mm. that is needed for in a workplace context Mm. I'm talking Mm. well 
the really cynical part of me, which, you know, unfortunately after almost 20 years of law happens, um, it says that, you know, people change their behaviours for either fear or greed. And I think Me Too is a very fear-driven um, campaign in terms of, you know, if are we going to address these issues in the workplace because we're scared about the damage to our brand that this can create, um, that will have a short-term effect, but it is, you know, very reactive and what I think we'd be better focusing upon, particularly as we go towards fatigue and, and we desensitise to these issues, um, is the, you know creating harmonious, healthy, respectful, inclusive workplaces. Um, not just because we want to have really nice places to work, which, geez, is a really good place to start, but also because of you know what we know they bring. Like I think the Diversity Council of Australia index said it. You know, employees are 17 times more satisfied. They're more productive. They're mm. more. Um, they're seven times less likely to be discrimination and se- sexual harassment claims in those sorts of workplaces. So, I think the focus on diversity and inclusiveness will will continue because it's the only way to create a best practice um, workplace. Um, and Me Too might have just given it a bit of a kick up from from a fear point of yeah. view. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, what are your hopes for 2019? Uh, not just in general, just, but in yeah. terms of... Uh, <laughs> right, personally. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of House know, on pre- the water. hopefully preventing um. more young women from ever having to deal with this like other generations mm. have had to deal with. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of the um, inquiry that Kate Jenkins is leading. Um, we will definitely see, you know, the employers that are invested in DNI will continue to be invested in DNI. And I think though the, those initiatives are becoming more impressive in the workplaces. And, you know, we'll, we'll start to talk about, you know, things like agile and, you know, flexible work as well as being one mm. one thing, one aspect of that. Um, but definitely values-based leadership, um, leading from the top. I mean, we've been doing a lot of training with boards and, and executive leadership teams. That's probably been the biggest increase in our work like the ability to get in front of these leadership teams and have a discussion about these issues and it's not about be scared about what me too can do to your to your business or be scared about all these potential legal claims because you know you can tell from the statistics that their complaints are rarely made and they rarely get to court anyway even Mm. if they are meritorious even if they are substantiated um but the messages that i've you know, sort of been been, been um, delivering to these teams and they're, they're being well received are things like, you know, the culture of your organisation will be shaped by the worst behaviour you will tolerate, not by your awards, not by, you know, going off to, uh, you know, the best practice employer of the year, um, you know, presentations each year. It's about, you know, what, what will ultimately, what you're ultimately prepared to tolerate from the inside and then that gets reflected on the outside and also about how you're making people feel. So if you don't, in order for people to report these issues, there needs to be trust um, that, that the leaders of the business will take them seriously, that they won't ostracise them, they won't victimise them as, as has been reported. Um, and the only way you can build trust is, is by action um, and making sure, um, you know, because they'll remember how you make, m- make them feel. It's about, um, you know, not what you say or do, but literally how you, how you deliver um, on on their trust and confidence when when they put themselves in a vulnerable position to make these disclosures, and the disclosures might be about little things, but they can often unchecked lead to the big things. So I think the good employers will will be invested in doing the right things. Um, in terms of more broadly, I think that there there may be you know some some um, legislative change. Mm. Um, and it could be to increase, um, for example, to include sexual harassment as a form of adverse action under the Fair Work Act, which will mean that um, you know civil penalties can be involved, people can be um, personally culpable for being involved in a contravention. Or I think the easier way, and I haven't seen it talked about much, is to have an extension of the Fair Work Commission's um, jurisdiction to stop the bullying where you know Mm. it's a protective jurisdiction it's Mm. not about compensation people can make an urgent application it has to be dealt with really quickly um, and orders can be made by the commission that are fairly protective um, to stop the bullying breach of those you know orders or directions that the commission gives um, you know can result in a civil penalty and they can refer it to a safety regulator Um, those sorts of things uh, if those sorts of changes are made then there will be definitely, um, you know, 
not just momentum, but you know, a real imperative for mm. for businesses to to address these issues. But yeah. We, we, we're only really speculating about where the changes will be. Mm. I mean, it feels like that's really needed in the sense of a lot of the changes that we've seen happen and the headlines that occur from employers, they're really about large corporate employers. Mm. And, and, and often that's because they have the profile or the partners or whoever have yeah. the profile to make it an interesting story in the media. And that seems to be where the more damaging risk or, or the, the more damaging reputational... Exactly. Um, mm. So the more reputational damage can occur... So, and I often worry about uh, often small businesses who might not even be aware of this mm-hmm. movement necessarily um, and the the people who are at risk in those small businesses which obviously employ the majority of Australians. Mm-hmm. But that sort of legislative change can make sure that those people are captured too. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and the, the difficulty with the smaller businesses is that there is um, – there's not a great delineation between the person that's receiving the complaint, the person mm. that is, you know, the yeah, ultimately, per, 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 mm. you know, quite often perpetrating, um, and the victim. If you've got a business with with ten people in it, likelihood is there's no independent HR, and um, if it is a power issue, that it's someone that is in the ownership team or very closely connected to it. Mm. Yes. Okay. One of the things that I have been reflecting on lately. In, in regard to Me Too, but also in terms of actually domestic violence, because one of the things that mm. um, I was at an event a few weeks ago and there was a discussion about the health and safety aspect of, of domestic violence and obviously not just the very, very far extreme when people lose their lives, but what are the actual health and safety impacts on women and children mm. and you know who, who live in those sort of violent um, environments? And it's the same with, with sexual harassment. I think... I, I think that an education mm-hmm. campaign um, that actually focuses on the fact that sexual harassment is not just an issue that occurs in one box and mm-hmm. you can sort of leave that person alone or leave that workplace. The impact, and I mean, we've seen that, if anything, f- from Me Too, we have seen from so many of the stories that mm-hmm. have come out, the impact on individuals' lives is is usually adverse and mm-hmm. it's usually actually far more adverse for the victim or the survivor than it is for the perpetrator. And I just wonder whether there's some way that, um, I mean, I know, safe, again, this is limited to big corporations, but I know safety, when directors became personally mm. liable for ensuring the safety of employees, mm. suddenly safety mm. was actually a huge issue and the standards lifted. Yeah. And I just wonder whether there's any way that we can, I mean, in terms of the domestic violence framework, that's very different, but the, um, the people who were speaking were saying they think a sort of public health campaign along the lines of the importance of like stopping smoking or using sun cream, actually communicating very clearly to the whole of Australia mm. what the safety concerns are in terms of you know disrespectful relationships, unhealthy relationships, violence mm. control, all those sorts of things. So that's one thing. But then I do just wonder about if we can, if harassment and bullying were actually considered to compromise the health and safety of employees, mm. which we know they do. Mm. I wonder whether that's one way that cultural change could actually be affected by using a stick, making mm. um, people culpable for it. I, I expect if there is a you know, broadened compliance regime, it will be um, centred around safety. Um, I think part of the terms of reference of the inquiry do reference the mental health consequences, mm. um, and I expect there will be some interaction um, you know, with how the regulator may may get involved, I was surprised to see that only thirty six percent of um, the respondents to the national inquiry, you know, the um, annual mm, survey mm. that uh, it's not annual, it's the fourth survey that the um, Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission put put out. Only thirty six percent of respondents said that they had a mental health consequence arising from sexual harassment. Um, as advisors, we don't know you know, what Mm. what the impact is going to be. So in any circumstances where there has been a serious consequence, um, you know, any like I said earlier, any diligent advisor will have to contemplate that there would be Mm. um, or could be some impact on the mental health um, and, you know, the health, safety and welfare of the employee. Things like, you know, employee assistance programs should be offered very quickly um, and the risks arising you know, from a, from safety issues and the personal culpability that, you know, mm. officers face um, are always, you know, brought to the forefront. But that's assuming that all employers dealing with these issues are getting um, advice yeah. and good advice. Mm. Um, you know, it, mm. if you look at, you know, the legislation in isolation, doesn't really 
uh, like the Sexual Harassment um, or Sex Discrimination Act doesn't really contemplate the safety issues. Mm, mm. Um, but certainly there's nothing stopping from a report to a regulator um, from from a serious sexual harassment complaint, and I think if it's if it's co- if it's a, between colleagues or you know sort of peers, depends on the severity of you know w- what's said or done. Mm. Um, when it is a superior, even if it's the smallest stuff, I think it's quite insidious and again can be quite damaging on someone's mental health and safety mm. um, because their um, livelihood and their security mm. of employment is tied to mm. this person um, who is constantly. Um, you know, making these remarks and undermining their, you know, integrity and credibility and their welfare in the workplace. So, uh, you know, there's different, there's, there's the spectrum of what we see is so broad, mm. um, but it, it all can be quite consequential. This is a commercial break for Work It Out. We'll be back in a moment. But if you're interested in being a sponsor for Work It Out or Women's Agenda, just drop us a line and let us know. That's womensagenda.com.au. I might move on to our next topic, which, I mean, it it does share some similarities in a way, but um, I I wanted to talk about the normalisation of flexible work, which, again, it seems like it is something that is occurring in certain types of work, in Mm. certain, uh, among certain large employers, uh, and by normalisation we see it in terms of, well, there has been legislation that's obviously mm. assisted. There's also more senior leaders working flexibly and we're also seeing a, a push, more of a millennial push around the expectations that flexible work is a mm. thing that uh, should that employers that want to compete for the best talent should be offering. So, Faye, I, I wanted to get your perspective on this because I know that it's another topic that you've been very mm. passionate about and that you've written a lot about as well. Do, do you see any kind of flexibility divide occurring amongst Mm. Australian employees having access to this in the sense that some may get it once again maybe if they're working for larger Mm. employers or depending on what industry they're in depending on what kind of shift work or what kind Mm. of do um, work they actually do in the first place whereas others are just so beyond Mm. even thinking about it and I've heard these stories of people in different industries where First of all, the thought of asking for it just is still so foreign. Mm. When they have asked for it, it's just been met with a just not even just a no, but a mm. what do you do? You not want to work here? <laughs> yeah, where, where do you land on that? Yeah, look, it, it, we don't get a lot of um, work from the smaller businesses, and we certainly don't um, see point blank refusals of flexible work arrangements you know in the way that we you know used to maybe a decade ago Mm. um you know and and we would always advise obviously about you know are there you know genuine business grounds um to refuse it and um you know would it pose an unjustifiable hardship on the organization from a um, discrimination point of view and we've always sort of just talked about that what's what are reasonable business grounds obviously for a much smaller organization uh, quite different mm. to what a very large organization so they have a lot more reasonable can, grounds exactly to do it. Yeah. Okay. can accommodate um, we are seeing again the larger organizations it's not just about complying with the legislation it's about you know how do they attract the best talent from the mm. next generation how do they keep um, you know the, all the the people that they've invested in for for so many years in the workplace and and not um, you know, lose them to to other employers or their own businesses. Or, um, but the the focus certainly has been starting to shift to not just you know flexible work being for return to work mums or for a stated reason, but for flexible work and a move to agile working being um, you know a concept that employers are embracing per se in order to create more inclusive workplaces and to help employ employees balance their work and family lives or their personal lives, you know, sport, health, recreation. That is unlikely to be something that, you know, the small business up the road is um, accommodating or has, you know, an appetite for and arguably has reasonable business grounds to um, to refuse. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not, we're not screwed. We're, we're in, in terms of the legislation that is there, um, it doesn't necessarily scrutinise or it doesn't scrutinise. The, the grounds upon which the, the denials are made. You just have to follow a process. Yeah, okay. Do you see much change or likelihood for change occurring there or is it just, I mean, like you say, from a small business's perspective, it, the, the possibilities are just not there? 
Or is there other possibilities that they could be exploring in the sense of more work from home or more adaptable hours somehow? They are. And there is definitely a move to more flexible work, different flexible work arrangements. It might not be um, a formal flexible work arrangement, but we are seeing, you know, businesses large and, sm- and smaller um, all, all are asking for things like work from home policies, um, safety checklists, all the things that are... Um, you know, it's contemplated that employees will be working outside the falls of the workplace mm. um, and there's definitely more flexibility, which, you know, frankly gets um, the best out of their employees and also means that they work outside of hours a lot of the time. So some small businesses are the, are the quickest and, and the most agile and the best to embrace flexibility. It's just in some, um, you know, more traditional environments there, there, might, there might still be resistance, but we don't... We really honestly don't get many disputes around flexible work anymore. Mm. Georgie, mm. we sort of share a job in a way, mm. um, all we parts do. of our job. Mm. And it was that's certainly how we started our working relationship, that we, we shared a, a, the editing women's agenda job once mm. I returned from maternity leave. And it wasn't really formally put that way as a job share, but um, it was definitely how it was happening and how it would occur. But one thing I don't understand, or I mean... I don't get why we don't see more job sharing arrangements in more formal ways. Have you been picking up on it at all? Well, I have. I think that with um, with job sharing as well as flexibility, I think there still is a lot of stigma and and misunderstanding. I think sometimes if people, you know, I think it would be possible to sit down and think, if you were thinking in a certain way, is there any way this job could be cut in half? I think it's really easy for people to come up with reasons why that wouldn't work and why that would be too mm. hard. And actually, I was facilitating a corporate day last week and it was women in finance and a number of them were talking at, about their different situations and a few of them um, were discussing this very thing that basically they, in their industry, it's really, the you know, high-end finance, people just think, no, you cannot, you can't have flexibility, you can't job share, you can't work part-time. And we sort of scrutinise these topics through different people Mm -hmm. and it is really hard to know what is exactly the right answer because absolutely when it comes to trading and things like that, there are regulatory concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't actually just do trades from home necessarily. Mm -hmm. But how much of the resistance to that Mm -hmm. sort of change is because people aren't sort of thinking laterally, they're not thinking creatively. I think that you and I, the way our job works, it came about fairly organically Mm. um, and... I I mean, I think my starting position is that almost every job, every position Mm. can be managed flexibly, more efficiently, you know, by thinking creatively about what's the best way to work. I mean, Mm. even, you know, I was talking to my sister the other day and she works for a smaller business, but she basically now works from seven till four because it means that she misses the traffic getting Mm. to work. And then in the afternoon, she's home. They've got little. They've got kids at school as well, and she feels like it's much easier for her then to manage the kids' after school mm-hmm. activities and etc. I wouldn't call that flexible work. No, no, but, yeah. I, no. I wouldn't call that flexible work either. But it is flexible in the sense that it took you know, and that's a small business. It's been shifted, for but her they've said, well, what? It, it doesn't actually. You don't technically mm. need to be here from nine to five. Mm. You know, let's look at it. And I and I just think you know that we that's definitely not. A, you know a radical flexible work arrangement but I think having those sorts of conversations mm. and and being open to different ideas about how a job can be done I think that is a really big barrier to mm. you know I think that's why and also people I don't know it is difficult when you're in a position if you're in a full-time job it is difficult to imagine okay how would I split this with another mm. person how would I work that it seems like a very big unwieldy mm. tricky proposition yeah and it's especially difficult if you're applying for the job in the first place Mm -hmm. and you see it advertised somewhere and you think I'm perfect for that but I cannot do that full time Mm -hmm. and how would I yeah either request to do it flexibly or how would I request to share it with somebody else where would I find that Mm -hmm. job share person and and does that just put more onus on the employer who's then even more unlikely to hire me or something yeah way it adds Mm -hmm. additional barriers yeah. Mm. You have, I mean, we've got to ad, uh, launch the Agile Working Policy with our diversity and inclusiveness team at Hall & Wilcox. And we've, you know, when when we did launch it on Flex Work Day last year, um, or this year actually, um, we what we said was you have to start with a let's make this, how can we make this work mindset? Mm. Um, it re- You do really have to have, you know, a shift in mindset from 
you know, this is impossible, this, this can't work, this is going to be, you know, too hard to it is possible and, you know, it might be challenging. And I, I've got to admit, you know, we've got people that work flexibly in teams and have, have had for many years. Um, it does put a little bit more pressure on the leader to coordinate and, frankly, you know, if if big litigation comes in, you know, to pick it up when, mm. when someone is off. Um, but that's that's the... That's a small price to pay for retaining, you know, someone that you've trained and, and nurtured and developed for six years mm, um, mm. in, you know, some pretty important years of their life. And I've, I just find the more you give, the more you get. And um, the more accommodating, you know, we've been with, with people, um, I just find that they they always go the extra mile um, mm. on, you know, when when – it's really necessary when you really need them. They've n- they've never said no to me, um, and I I think from an organisational point of view, we have to recognise that there are structural challenges to the progression of women. Like it's not just you know this whole mind you know their mindset or that they mm, want the you know, promotion choice. or their choice mm. or um, you know they're opting out all of that. Um, mm. There is a serious structural barrier mm. to the progression of women in our profession and in professions and leadership roles more broadly. And ad- unless we address it, um, we're not going to see any... Fu- we haven't seen any fundamental change and we're not going to see any significant change. Um, but I also am, you know, <laughs> unapologetic in, um, in saying it has to be across the board and men need to be... Um, you're working flexibly as well and unless you know flexible work arrangements are embraced um, by and for all employees um, women are always going to be at a yep. disadvantage and that's mm. the normalization that we need yeah. to mm. occur I think that's the it's it's important there what you said about the mindset because I think that and this goes for all aspects of life not just flexibility but if you approach a problem with the mindset that yes, we can work this out, Mm. you will find solutions. If you approach the problem with a really narrow view that this is actually the way it's always been done and it needs to be done like this, then it's Mm. going to be really difficult for you to Change um, change that. And I think... That changing that mindset is actually quite critical because to make it not a boutique issue that just women take up, mm. we actually do need there to be sort of widespread understanding that mm. working flexibly is not the same as, you know, working part-time or being exactly. disinterested in your mm. career. It's it's actually very different to that. It's yeah. just the same amount of work is going to get done, probably more, probably better work, yep. but it might not look like someone coming into the office from eight till six every mm. single day. Yeah, mm. um, it's mainstreaming and it's, mm. you know, moving away from, you know, jackets on the back of chairs, you know. Yes. But, but the other thing that we did say um, when we launched is that, you know, we're sharing success stories and we've got heaps of people across the business, you know, who, who have, you know, put up internal posts on Yammer about things that are working well. Um, but I did say that it's also really important to speak up where it's not working mm. um, because I think there's nothing that undermines, you know, policies and anything, any initiatives um, more than, you know, sort of people just, you know, saying yay, you know, in in public forums and and then in corridors, you know, undermining it because there was this one time when, you know, someone was working flexibly and they dropped the ball and then, we, you know, something happened and the client wasn't happy or whatever it is um, and having that become the narrative about, why flexible work doesn't work mm. Mm. yeah plenty mm. of people have dropped the ball before they were ever working flexibly yeah so. <laughs> yes we can all yeah. drop the ball yeah, in yeah. Every we might move on to our recommendations so we do this every week we share a key oh. thing we've been reading or watching or listening to um on netflix or on our reading shelf or on itunes whatever it is so i'll start with you georgie okay great well my recommendation this week is actually it's probably actually not that helpful because it's almost finished. But last week as an early Christmas present, I went and saw the Wharf Review um, at the Sydney Theatre Company. And obviously, as you can imagine, each year they do a sort of wrap-up of the year. Um, it's it's comedy and they look at politics. So as you can imagine, there was just no shortage of <laughs> material of to work with this year. <laughs> yep. um, a couple of the highlights, there was Pauline Hanson doing a, a speech at her book launch. There was mm. Barnaby Joyce singing a song about some of his life choices this year um there was also two men and they were dressed up one was donald trump and one was the queen reenacting that meeting and i honestly mm-hmm. i could not stop laughing my stomach was so sore the next day <laughs> and i kept replaying it in my head also actually the very 
best highlight was one of the performers um, imitating Paul Keating giving a speech in which he basically gave, you know, um, some pretty biting analysis of the key players in Australian politics this year. And honestly, it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. So next year, and also they do travel around Australia, but if you can get tickets to the Wharf Review next year or whenever it's going around, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Awesome. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, I don't have tickets for this year, but something no, to think about well, next year. They, you did they tell they me did about actually, it last year and I didn't know I did, much about but they it. Actually, so. they, they did extend the season this year, so I actually think you could potentially get tickets oh. if you were in Sydney in this week, but that's um, by the, it's the 10th of December. By the time you hear this podcast, yeah. it might not be on. Babe, do you have anything? Oh, it's so funny because when you, when you sent when you said um, this might come up, I thought this is such a bad time of year to ask me about this <laughs> because between two kids and full time legal practice, I tell you what, there's very limited free time um, in December. However, I am um, very late arriving to podcasts and. Um, I'm like a kid in a candy shop at the <laughs> yeah, moment but... with them. I, I just, I don't know how this revolution escaped me. So I am listening to Chat 10 Looks 3 and I've, I've listened to sort of like four or five of them and, you know, can't get them enough. But it's it's getting a bit, you know, I'm sort of going backwards, which is, you know, not not ideal. Um, cannot wait to read Any Ordinary Day, obviously, mm. um, by Lee Sales um, because that's on my reading list for Christmas and the very long couple week break that I've got coming up. Um, failing fabulously I've listened to is Sammy Lucas. And then when the going gets really tough and I just need to de-stress, um, um, Tara Brax meditations <laughs> because, um, you know, everyone needs a little bit of downtime and um, she, she's, she, her voice is quite hypnotic. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was, yeah. So I, I love it because um, I've noticed that also I've got a seven-year-old who talks heaps like I've got a 12 year old that grunts basically all the time mm-hmm. um and then this but the seven year old because I don't see him so much during the week um and he's a talker I have no idea where he gets it from it's really weird like <laughs> there's, just, there's just no one that talks that much in my family um but he just talks at me like all weekend and I um now for the last few weeks have been putting earphones in and he's not alive to it so I nod occasionally um I look, do this too don't <laughs> Don't judge me on my parenting. No, I'm not. When I actually, am, it's no. a suggestion that somebody else in this podcast has made before. <laughs> it's probably been me. I the, probably gave Georgie is. the detailed specs on which headphones mm. to get. Yes. <laughs> but no, I do. And I might make that my recommendation then. But I love podcasts. I've, I've been a huge podcast fan for, for years. And um, probably before they were, I used to listen to, the first thing I used to listen to was ABC's uh, Richard Bidler's conversation now and I used to go on and stream it somehow yeah. before it was kind yes, of considered yeah. a podcast and yep. I, that was I used to go running with them and I'd put mm. in a couple of them for my really long runs mm. and I'd enjoy these just amazing conversations that already lined up but um now that you know I've got kids and less time and less time particularly for long runs um <laughs> those sorts of runs definitely walks but, on the beach no <laughs> few walks on the beach but definitely transports or on the mm. way home I always yeah. I listen to podcasts. I usually listen to the news on the way to work and then transition to podcasts or something lighter on the way home. Mm. But I've definitely found investing in, if you can, or if you can put it on your Christmas list, they are really expensive, but some kind of wireless headphone. <laughs> so, um, like your AirPods, that's what I use. And it is really handy. And especially, you know, you're doing um, some housework or you're cooking yeah. dinner or whatever it is, and you're, you're doing work anyway and I know that maybe you should be doing mindfulness or meditating at the same time as you're chopping the vegetables but I like to use that time to to listen to podcasts and there's so much good mind. stuff out there exactly yeah. yes yes and with that we'll wrap up so thank you so much for joining us Faye thank so you. much insight and knowledge it's been incredible incredibly packed uh, 30 minutes or so so thank you very much Thank you, Georgie, again. Thank you. And a reminder, you can check out a lot of the things that we are discussing at um, uh, womensagenda.com.au. And thank you to Eagle Ways Radio for having us in here once again. Thank you. That's a wrap for Talk It Out, the Women's Agenda podcast, powered by Eagle Ways Radio. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and jump on the website for more amazing shows. Catch you next time.